Hi there, I'm here today to talk to you about a bread called Tress. Tress, or Sof in Swiss German, is an enriched bread which is typically served on Sundays or special occasions. In my family, we like to serve it at Christmas and Easter, which is coming up. Sof is a delicious bread and it's typically braided. It's a four strand braid, unlike something like challa, which tends to have a three strand braid. So this is an enriched bread, uh, meaning that there are things like milk and butter and eggs in it, but our base is always going to be an all-purpose flour. This is not a bread flour based bread. So we're going to start with our recipe with 600 grams of all-purpose flour. Then we have over here 330 grams of regular milk. So whatever you have on hand, it could be homogenized 2%, 1%. I have here regular white granulated sugar and I have with my sugar 25 grams, then I have my yeast. My yeast, it's important that I have a, a pretty fine yeast. You want a regular fine yeast that's going to dissolve nicely in my lukewarm uh, milk and my sugar is going to feed that yeast while it blooms. I also have unsalted butter here, which I'm going to use to enrich my dough. And I have 50 grams, which I've uh, cut into small pieces and is sitting here at room temperature. I have salt, which I'm going to use to season my dough, and I have 10 grams of fine salt. And finally, I have one egg. Now, the other tools that you might need are a small whisk, which you're going to use to make your sponge, and obviously a kitchen scale to weigh out your separate ingredients. Because all of my ingredients are pre-weighed here, I just have my scale here as a sort of a prop. Okay, so what I'm going to start by doing is I'm going to take my milk and I'm going to put it in the microwave. Now, I don't want this to be hot. If it's hot, it will kill my yeast. I need it to be lukewarm. Okay, so I'm going to pop this in my microwave for about a minute to start with. Then I'm going to stir it, check the temperature, and if I need to, add an additional 20 seconds. So while my milk is in the microwave, I'm actually going to form something called a well in my bowl. So right now I have 600 grams of flour that's just in the bottom of my bowl. This is a relatively shallow kid pool, meaning that the sides are not super high or steep like a mixing bowl for your, your KitchenAid. And I'm just going to simply take the back of my hand or my knuckle area and I'm going to push out along my bowl as I turn, creating a nice hole in the bottom of my bowl. By doing this, I now have a nice area at the bottom where I'm going to be pouring my milk, my sugar, and my yeast after it's dissolved slightly. So I now have my well at the bottom of my bowl. And I can see the bottom of my bowl, and that's totally fine. That's exactly what I want. And my milk has just beeped here. So I'm going to check for temperature. So I'm going to put my finger into the middle of the milk, and it's perfect, okay? And what you're gonna wanna do before you add your sugar and your yeast in is you're just gonna wanna stir your milk up to make sure that you don't have any hot spots in your milk. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my granulated sugar here and I'm going to pour that into my milk. And again, I'm just going to stir it up to start dissolving it. You can hear my children in the background. Everyone's going a little batty because we're kind of in quarantine here in Canada right now with COVID. So we've now been inside. This is our third week. I'm going to take my yeast and I'm going to put it into my milk and my sugar. And I'm going to stir this up and I'm going to continue stirring until all my yeast is dissolved and the yeast starts to do something called bloom. Now I'm going to put my well back at the center and I'm going to take my milk and I'm going to pour it into the center of my well. So now what I'm going to do is I'm gradually going to add the sides of my well into my milk, my yeast, and my sugar. And my goal is something like a pancake batter. So just by simply adding a little bit of flour at each time. 
So now you can see that the consistency of the milk in the center of my well has changed and it's a lot more thick and it's very nice in terms of its consistency. So this batter here that's at our center or our pancake batter is going to do something called create a sponge and that sponge is going to be what creates the leavening agent for the rest of the bread. I'm going to put this into an oven with the oven light on. So you can see behind me that my oven, I have the light on and that's been on for a little while and that just creates enough residual heat um, to keep the sponge away from drafts and also to create the proper lift that I need. So I have here a clean tea towel and I'm going to moisten my tea towel underneath my faucet and wring it out really well because I don't want to add any additional moisture to my sponge. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place my tea towel over my kud pool and my pancake batter and I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it in my oven with the light on for approximately 25 minutes. So you can hear my timer in the background. That means that my 25 minutes is up. One of the things that I noticed when I put my sponge into the oven was that I had forgot to put my softened butter around the outside of my well. Uh, that was probably because of the screaming distractions that were in the background. So my husband, who's Swiss German, is watching me like a hawk and he was like, oh no, we gotta put the butter in. So while we cut, we put the butter in and around. It's really important that your butter go in the oven with the warming light on because you want it to continue to soften. If it's on your counter, um, it will continue to soften, obviously, but we're still in uh, early April here, so it's cold enough in our house that it's still going to have some uh, bite to the butter, so it's better if it goes in with the sponge into the oven. So I'm going to take my bowl out, and I'm going to be very gentle with it. And I'm going to take it off, and it's beautiful. Like, you can see in my bowl how airy and fluffy my sponge is and you can see that my butter is nicely placed around the edge of my bowl itself. So now I have two things that I need to do here before I start to combine this. Uh, the first is I'm going to take my salt and I'm going to lightly place it just around the edge of my bowl. Now this is an excellent little bowl because it's actually silicone so I can kind of squish it together which kind of gives me a pouring spout. So my mother-in-law always told me you never want your salt to touch your sponge because it can out affect the outcome of your bread. And then the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to crack my egg which is coming up to room temperature here in a bowl. And I'm just going to break the yolk up slightly before I go ahead and I place this in the center of my well. So this is the last ingredient that's going to go into our soap dough um, in order to create the enrichment. So remember, this is an enriched dough, so we have butter, egg, and milk, okay? So now that that's been lightly beaten, I'm gonna put it in my sponge, and my sponge sort of like gobbled it up. You can see that in the bottom, it's kind of the egg has disappeared and there's a tiny little well at the center. So the next thing that I'm going to do, because this is a very sticky dough, because it's enriched and I am doing this by hand, I have non-latex gloves here. So I'm going to put these on and I'm going to push up my sleeves because obviously I do not want dough all over myself. These are a snug fit. Okay, and what I'm going to start to do is I'm just going to start to bring the outside of my well into the center of my sponge slowly. So this is combining the salt, the butter, and the flour into the sponge, which is the yeast, the milk, the sugar, and a small bit of my all-purpose flour. And I want to continue doing this. I'm going to continue bringing it in and this is going to form the base of my dough. So the gloves make it incredibly easy to peel off any little bits of dough that accumulate on them, unlike with hands. And I'm going to just keep turning my dough over so that I get all of 
the loose ingredients that might not have been incorporated into the bottom of the bowl. And I'm going to start kneading my dough in the bowl before I turn it out. So I'm gonna pause here and I'm gonna turn out my dough and this is actually a little bit too high for me to be comfortable. So I'm going to move this out of the way. I'm a shorter person than my husband. so. And at this point, I can turn my dough out onto my clean counter and I'm gonna continue kneading. And I'm gonna knead for about 10 minutes until the dough fully comes together and you'll note that it's smooth and homogenous. So you really know when your bread is done or your bread dough is done when it does something called window painting. So obviously right now, um, I just started kneading my dough and if I attempt to window pane or bring my dough up to stretch, the fibers just break. So there really isn't a lot of gluten that's developed yet. So you'll know after the 10 minutes is up that your bread dough is done because it will window pane very well and I'll show you that. So we've been kneading our dough now for 10 minutes and you can use different techniques. You can use the two-handed technique or you can do the one hand where you just are continuing turning. Our dough has changed a lot. It's very smooth. If you touch the dough surface, it has a lot of tension, but it's relaxed in terms of when you touch it, it's very nice feeling and the skin on the dough is smooth like a baby's bottom. Now, the big test is something called window painting. So what you do is you take a little bit of your dough and you're simply gonna stretch it. Your goal is not to rip it, but if you can expand the dough and make a very thin, almost semi-translucent skin without it ripping in the center there, then you're good. So now I have my bowl here. So this is the bowl that I used before. All I did was I simply rinsed it out and dried it off. You don't really wanna put it into a damp bowl. And I'm going to take my dough I'm going to place it in the bottom of my bowl and I'm going to use the damp tea towel that I had before and I'm going to recover my dough and I'm going to put it back into the oven with the oven light on but this time it's going to go in there for about an hour and a half until it's roughly doubled in size. So I'm going to set a timer. And when this beeps, we'll be able to start shaping our truss. So our hour and a half is almost up um, and our bread dough has been proofing in the oven with the light on and my timer is right about to go off. And I took a peek at it earlier and it is puffed up beautifully. Now I'm gonna bring my dough over here and I'm going to set aside my damp cloth because I'm going to knead it again later to place over my little balls once I've formed them. You can see here that my dough is very nicely risen. It's puffy, it's airy, there's some bubbles on the surface, that's great. We know that it's very active, you can see it jiggle slightly in the bowl. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just take my fist and punch lightly down onto the dough so that we can see that it's all collapsed. And at this point, I'm just going to bring my bread dough into the center of my bowl, pick it out, and set my bowl aside. Now the next step seems a bit violent, but it's necessary. So silk is a very dense bread. It has very few bubbles in it. It's not like sourdough or conventional yeast-based bread. And what we need to do to achieve that texture is we essentially need to beat the dough 40 times. So I'm not sure what the rationale is behind the 40 times uh, the beating, but my mother-in-law says that it's critical that we do it 40 times. So you basically make your dough nice and long, sort of like a baguette shape, and you beat your dough and then you fold it over. So, and you really want to make a nice smack on your counter when you do it. So we're at four and you need to do this 40 times. So it's really quite a workout.
Four more. It's getting stiffer. And last one. Okay, so now that my bread has had it, the snot beaten out of it, I'm going to take my scale here and I'm going to measure the overall weight of my dough. So I'm going to place my scale or my dough on the scale and it's 1,025 grams exactly. And I need four strands. Hey Google, what's 1,025 divided by four? The answer is 256.25. So we're gonna make each one of our little, little balls at 256. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my coupe out or my bench scraper. And I'm gonna put here Now it's give or take. So this one is 257, so that's perfect. We're gonna put that guy on. We'll take all these little bits that we took off. Okay, there we go. We'll cut this remaining portion. We need a little bit more here. Okay. okay, so now that we have roughly all four of our uh, balls rolled out, what we need to do is make our dough homogenous again, since we have put all of the little pieces on top of it. So we need to roll it around with our hands to build some tension and create a nice little ball. So that's one. So you're gonna cup your hands, sort of like as if you're receiving a ball. Okay, and we're gonna do this four times. Then I'm gonna set these over to the side to relax since we've been working these a tiny bit. And I'm going to separate them so that they don't touch one another. And then I'm going to take my cloth, which I set aside earlier. I'm gonna fold it in half and I'm going to cover my little babies up so that they don't build a skin on top and we're going to wipe up our counter okay you don't want any little dough bits on your counter for when you go to roll out your truss so again remember this makes two tresses or two soaps and you can either make two you could make three tiny little ones or you can make one enormous one since we're a family of four for easter the half recipe dividing it in two is great. So I'm just gonna dry this off because we don't want any moisture here. And when we prepare our soap, we're gonna be putting it on a jelly roll pan. And we have here, you can either use parchment or you can use a silk pad. We're gonna set this aside and we're gonna be placing our tresses onto here. Now, I have a special guest today, my husband who is Swiss German, is going to come and actually roll the tresses out because he always makes fun of my boudins and my tress and he says, well, you've made a mistake somewhere. So he's going to show you the perfect way to shape your tress so that you end up with the perfect soap. So I'm going to let him take the boudins that, or the uh, little balls that I put under the cloth here and make the boudin and I'm going to explain how uh, he's going to be putting it together. So let's move our jelly roll pan here just off to the side. Hello. So when you do your boudin, uh, you want to take the ball and you want to press firmly from the middle and as you work out. And you want your little boudin or your sausage to essentially be slightly thicker in the middle and slightly more narrow on the ends. And it has to be pretty long. So. When you are first working the dough, you'll note that it's very elastic. It's gonna sling back on itself quite often. 
that's okay. You want to be persistent. And it should be, oh, about two feet long, each one, if you're doing um, a, uh, a two times tress. So each boudet should be about two feet long, and you only want to work with two balls at one time. You don't want to try and make both tresses simultaneously. So once you have one nicely formed boudet or sausage, you can lay it down in front. They actually can't see it. <laughs> and you go and you form the second one. And you want them to be relatively symmetrical in terms of their length and in terms of where the snake has swallowed the rat or guinea pig. So there should be like a bulge in the center. And the bulge is important because when you go to form the tress, it's a four strand braid, you want the tress to have a slightly fatter uh, knot end. So it gives it a more pleasing look if there's a very graduated uh, look to the braid. If it's too uniform, then it doesn't look like a soap. And here is actually a, a bubble airing on the inside, so you just rip the dough open and let burst the bubble. You don't want any large bubbles in your soap because it takes away from the overall dense texture of it. So once you have two boudets that are roughly similar, you can compare them. So here are two that are nice. You're going to make a cross. So the cross, the first part of the cross should be parallel with the edge of your counter and the other part of the cross should go lengthwise across your counter and you want to be roughly halfway between uh, both parts of the dough. So one part is over, one part is under. So these are the four strands. So anytime you're making a four strand braid, you need to be cautious about not getting your ends mixed up. So when you start, my husband likes to braid left over right, I believe. I think so, yeah. So you start with your left hand. Well, you start with the, with the strand that's underneath. You take both ends and you cross them. Picture this as crossing your legs. Then you cross the other one over. So crossing the legs and again. You always cross the same legs the same ones on the same you. strand and once you get to the end the little bits will be sort of a little bit smaller uglier looking and smaller you want to bunch them together give them a nice pinch and tuck, tuck their under. end underneath then you can roll your bread a little bit to give it a nice shape like this and once it's shaped we're going to put it on the jelly roll pan. So it looks beautiful. So you should be able to fit two of these uh, tresses onto a half hotel pan or a half jelly roll pan. So a standard jelly roll that would fit into your oven. And you're just going to repeat the same process for the last two pieces of dough. So rolling out your boudin or your sausage to about two feet long with a bulge in the center, sort of like a snake that swallowed a rat. So always go your hands together and work it out. And you need to press pretty hard, but not too hard, not to rip the dough. And as you can see, this one is a bit easier to roll out because the dough has relaxed a bit more. So we have one strand. And we're gonna do our second one quickly. Now once you have your two tresses uh, shaped and formed and they're placed onto your pan, they need to go into the refrigerator for about three hours and even overnight is totally fine. Um, so these go into the fridge and you want them to be cold. So it sort of stunts the proofing a second time and it allows them to form a really nice, delicious, chewy crust on the exterior. So the outside of the bread will actually dry slightly that's totally okay. You do not want to put a cloth over these uh, or saran wrap over these into your refrigerator. So now we have our two other boudin ready and we're going to repeat the process again. Okay. So, so two strands. 
the two strands that are underneath, you cross, you cross the two other ones, and you do this until you get right. You run there. out of dough. And sometimes it helps if you actually go faster. If you slow down and hesitate, that's when you tend to make mistakes. If you second guess yourself, if you make a mistake before you go to seal the end up, just undo the two pieces and go back. Just like if you were making a hair braid. Nicely braided. And even if there's a mistake, it doesn't matter. It will taste the same. Right? So we have our two tresses that have been um, nicely formed here and the last thing that we're going to do before they go into the refrigerator No, we actually do this after they oh. rest it. Yeah, they oh, go I get excited. This. Yes, you're in a hurry. You're looking forward. You can proof these in the counter if you are, uh, you know, a little bit rushed. So say you made your dough the night before, it sat overnight in your fridge to proof instead of in your oven. Um, you could form these in the morning, then allow them to proof on your counter just for a little while, say like an hour and a half before you put them in the oven. We have done that once or twice. Um, but really you get the nicest, chewiest crust if it goes in the refrigerator yeah. for at least three hours and preferably overnight. Yeah. Well, not, with the fact that it's not covered in the fridge, it forms a nice crust. That's the dough. And that's the sign of a good soap, is having a nice exterior thick crust that's chewy and crunchy with an extremely tender sort of light yellow inside. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to place that in the refrigerator for now for three hours and when we come back uh, we're going to be popping these into the oven. We're going to be putting uh, an egg wash on the outside of them to achieve a nice golden shiny color and we'll be baking these off. So my bread has come out of my refrigerator and it's been in there for just over three hours now. Uh, when I touch the uh, skin of the bread, it's cool to the touch and it's kind of got a firm texture. That's one, because it's cold, and two, because it's dried out slightly from being in the fridge. You'll also note that in the cracks and crevices of your braid, you'll see some ripping or pulling, which is excellent. Um, you, it's harder to see on camera, but you'll note it more once we put it in the oven. So the shape of our breads is excellent. Thank you to my husband. Uh, and the next thing we're going to do before it goes into our oven is we're going to take an egg yolk. This is just the yolk, it's not the white, so it's an egg wash but only a yolk wash. And I'm going to break up my yolk and you really want to make sure that wherever there's bread that some of your egg yolk gets in there because without the yolk your bread will not get that beautiful color that Tress is pretty famous for. So you also don't want to leave pools of yolk in any of the cracks because that kind of gives it a, a less attractive look. So we're going to do a quick pass on the yolk, paying attention to all the little nooks and crannies on here. And behind me, I have preheated my oven to 390 degrees and you want your racks to be sort of like the second from the bottom. You don't want it to be uh, the lowest because obviously you don't want the bottoms of your bread to burn. This bread, remember, does have uh, enrichment in it. So it has sugar, it has eggs, it has butter, and it also has milk. So that means that it's going to uh, burn a little bit more quickly and easily than a bread uh, without a sugar. Okay, so one of those has now been egg washed and you can see that there's quite a difference in the color before and after the egg wash and also the sheen. Okay, now I'm going to egg wash the remaining braid. Same thing, paying close attention to the knot on the end. You want to really make sure that you get your wash down underneath, it, there's like a little fiber from my brush, down underneath all the way to the bottom. You don't want to stop just because you can't see. Down there. It's kind of like putting sunscreen on. Even though you can't see some areas, you really need to make sure that you get them. Otherwise, 
the browning will not be even. You'll end up with little areas that aren't quite as dark. And you can use up all your yolk. One, one yolk will usually do one recipe. Um, if you have three loaves of bread because you've made tiny ones, you might need a second yolk because it's just more surface area in the end. Okay, just just some areas down underneath and down under here. You ideally don't want any drips. Okay, so these look excellent. I'm going to put these into the oven. Now it's really important when these go in the oven, I have half of a cup of water here. It's warm water, just faucet water. And what I'm going to do is after I've put my bread in, I'm just going to put this into the bottom of my oven and it's going to create a steam injection sort of so that it will uh, capture that humidity. It'll help puff the bread up really quickly and it'll also help give it a nice firm crust, that extra humidity. We obviously don't have commercial ovens at home. Um, so this is one of the things that can give you that commercial result without having um, that extra fancy oven. So my oven is at 390 degrees behind me now. I'm going to take my tress over to the oven. I'm going to pop it into my pan. I'm going to throw my water in and I'm going to set my timer for 40 minutes. I'm going to know that my bread is done when it has a nice even golden color all the way around and I should be able to pick it up um, and knock it on the bottom to make sure that it's hollow sounding. About halfway through you want to make sure you're turning your pan in case there are any hot spots in your oven so that it achieves an overall golden color in the end. So we're right about to take our uh, soap out of the oven and we've been checking it periodically. We rotated it uh, 20 minutes through and we're at around the 37, 38 minute mark right now. Um, and we've decided that it's dark enough and it looks quite, quite awesome. And the house smells amazing. There's nothing quite like uh, baked soap, uh, the smell of it in the air in the house. So we're gonna take it out right now. And it's puffed up quite a lot, like substantially. And the two loaves are beautiful. You can see here the definition from the each little bump. Oh, sorry, it's really hot. <laughs> the definition between each little bump. Okay. And the glaze makes the... Um, the bread quite hot okay so you really want to be careful not to touch the bread without a mitt <laughs> or you'll scald your thumb like I've done twice now on the pan my oven mitts I guess aren't quite the same as they used to be so you want to pick your bread up and you know that your bread is done number one it has nice color all over the bottom and you can see the areas that are slightly darker those are not burnt areas that's just where your um, egg wash is pooled and if I do this you can hear that the inside of the bread is quite hollow and if I look at the top of my bread you can see the braid is just beautiful and gorgeous okay and there's definitely pulls and tears along the side um, where the fibers and the gluten have expanded as it has um, as it has grown right so both breads are equally as beautiful and you can see that graduated shape that we had talked about it's larger at the top and more narrow at the point now you want to allow this to cool fully before you cut it, um, at least to room temperature. Um, it's really better and that way it's less fragile. It's also awesome, this freezes really, really well. You want to make sure that it's cool to the touch before you put it in the freezer. But the best way to freeze it is to actually just freeze it on the jelly roll pan like this. 
Um, you put it in the freezer, wait till the bread itself is completely frozen. Once the bread is frozen, then you can go ahead and wrap it in whatever your choice is. It could be saran, it could be a large grocery bag or something like that. It's really better to do this technique, that way you don't trap additional moisture from the bread in the bag um, as the bread is cooling and you don't get those little droplets so that when you go to take your bread out of the freezer, your crust is softened and it's not as crispy and beautiful as it once was. It also toasts up great the next day, so if you want to leave it on your counter or you eat it fresh the first day, slice it and it makes great toast. It tastes great with things like Ravlax or honey or any type of homemade jam. I hope you enjoy this recipe and uh, you will give this a try at home for any special occasion or just for every day.